dampening down. We're back. We're live. I'm Jay Fidel, uh, and this is Community Matters, and uh, we're going to ask uh, what's going on already with, <laughs> with the ban. The Ninth Circuit ruled, uh, was it last Friday, was it? Today. Today. This morning. This morning. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Hot, hot, off, the, hot off the press this yeah, morning. Yeah, that's Claire Hanus, and she is an immigration lawyer, and she's been on our show many times, and she has done a lot of good things in Hawaii vis-a-vis -vis immigration, and she is familiar with the immigration community, that is, the people who would like to come here. So it's very important we get her take on the, the ruling in the Ninth Circuit, not only on this ban, but on the other bans that have come by and what's likely to happen in the Supreme Court. So what happened? This this morning, Claire. Oh, so this morning, the Ninth Circuit issued a decision that we had all been waiting for, um, and it basically upheld the um, injunction that Judge Watson issued back on March 15th in Hawaii. So there was a three-judge uh, three panel that issued a unanimous decision, and um, and it, it's, it's a great decision. It's 86 pages. It's available if you just Google Ninth Circuit. It came up right away. And I really mm -hmm. encourage people to um, take a read through it, because it's, it's, it's important for people to, to read and understand. And um, basically what the Ninth Circuit said is that um, in the, the, the sixth or seventh line, immigration, even for the president, is not a one-person show. So basically, the president has limitations to his power. This was a reaffirmation of, of the power of the judicial system um, to keep in check um, the president's attempts at, at extreme powers and um, sets things up for the, for the Supreme Court probably in the fall. Yeah. Well, it's, it's good news in many ways. It's good news for people who have been in, intimidated and disrupted over, the, over the, these bans. Uh, it's good news for the Constitution uh, in terms of, you know, yes, there is a, 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 um, a provision about um, religion, freedom of religion. Gee, the country was founded on that. Right. Um, and there's, there's also, I mean, to me, the important thing is the Constitution is alive and well in terms of the balance of power, the three the three, uh, you know, I heard, I heard recently that there was a, a poll taken of people in the street, and they were asked, what are the three uh, parts of government, you know? three branches of government in this country nobody knew yeah it's very scary yeah. because you know when you get trump on you know on the stage here people don't know and and we need the federal courts to articulate this and right. remind us right. what's going on and the ninth circuit is known to be a fairly liberal court so um this was probably expected but the fourth circuit ruled um somewhat similarly uh, a few weeks ago um on this issue, it was a little narrower issue. They were just looking at the people affected from the nine, or I'm sorry, from the six countries that were um, that Trump was trying to ban from entering. I did not ad address the refugee ban, which was in the state of Hawaii suit. But again, the Fourth Circuit, which is a much more conservative court, voted, I believe it was 12 to three, um, in favor of upholding the injunction as well. So um, it doesn't have to be from a liberal court. I mean, there can be minds that are more to the center or to the right that are recognizing and, again, speaking out to the limits of um, presidential power. Uh, the arguments in this case, in this court, in this case, weren't as much constitutional as kind of statutory. Um, the, the Immigration and Nationality Act, which um, which sets it well in the Constitution that um, Congress has power over uh, most immigration laws to create them. And then the 1952 Immigration Nationality Act gave the president some powers, um, but they're not at all unlimited. And so um, what this argument did, again, was from the Ninth Circuit, just reaffirmed that in order for the president to make such kind of sweeping bans against people, there need to be there needs to be much more as far as fact finding um, that um, there's a nexus between uh, the ban and all the people that that the government is trying to keep out of coming from the United States. So many questions flow out of this. I mean, some of the original questions, to me, they still linger. How do you do it right? I mean, let's assume he was motivated by a piece of national policy that says we have to protect ourselves from terrorists. Right, which how, we, how do you, how we do you can do all that? agree to. Uh, you know, I, I, look, I think we do a, a pretty 
a pretty good job at doing that. There is a vetting of um, all foreign nationals before they come into the United States. Um, but if you, you know, if you look at um, and and this case actually references a study that was done of you know terrorist acts in the United States from I think 2002 until the present. Um, the majority of those who committed were people who were born in the United States. So they're not people who were coming from overseas. True. So it's not really an immigration issue at all. Um, Right, not right, here. Right, and, then, and to and some then, extent, the same thing exists in Europe. A lot, a lot of the right. terror has been by people who were born in Europe. Absolutely. Uh, so, so looking at so why are people who are born in in, in these countries feeling so um, disaffected and disenfranchised that they're willing to take such really extraordinary measures? I don't have the answer for that, but it seems it's that, not a that that's thing. where. But that's where the effort should be going in to understand how this is coming out of out of our own communities. I think I think the the lesson is is that you can't. I don't think there is any way of crafting a band that um, that would affect. 180 million people. No. Which is the six countries that that were you know that were listed. 180 million people. There's no way unless you can show that the vast majority of those 180 people have direct links to uh, Can't. to terrorism. There's no cannot. way you can prove that. Right. It's not true. Right. It could it, never be true. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> and that's and that's what um and that and that's basically what the court held. You know, it's really too bad we have to have this conversation. Mm -hmm. It's too bad that he did that. I and and I mean, I'm not talking about all the other things he's done that are too bad, but this one is really too bad. And I, I think of uh, the Statue of Liberty. Give me your tired, huddled masses yearning to be right. free. This is a fundamental aspect of the country, and the country's uh, vitality, in right. large part, has been all through all through these 300 years, whatever many years, wait. 250, 40 years, whatever it is, right. um, has been based on that that notion of give me your tired, huddled masses. Right. Um, and, and that's where we get the strength of our uh, innovation, our economy, our workforce, um, and all our endeavors are really right. based in large part on recent arrivals. Right. Um, the immigrant mentality is more vital, maybe, than some of the com complacency. We see people who are not immigrants, right. honestly. Right, right. And if you look, I mean, especially in a place like Hawaii, I mean, you know, you can always look at and see how the first per the first people of, of, of nations have, have uh, immigration has, has usually been a bad thing for them, um, the Native Americans, um, Native Hawaiians here. Um, but for everyone else, um, you look at how immigrants actually benefit and enrich our society. Well, again, yeah, look at all of our own individual histories and, and how and why. Uh, again, we all came, even the, the, the first peoples, everyone came from someplace else yeah. for a reason, and people are still trying to yeah. do that. I think we quickly forget our own histories, our own family histories. Um, and the ability to you know, put ourselves in the shoes of people who are um, who have made more recent journeys, right? Right. right. We, we, we have very we short, very the short recent memories. arrivals. We shouldn't do that, and it happens right. in Hawaii too. Absolutely. You know, the, the, re, the, the new arrivals are the ones everybody, you know, I, I want mine, and I right. even though I'm also a recent arrival. Right. You know, the other thing is that we we have been a beacon. This country has been a beacon. Mm -hmm to the world mm -hmm. about opening your borders and taking those tired, huddled masses yeah. yearning to be free. Right. And, and one of the interesting things is that this, this, what this says is we're not sure about this anymore, that we have fights about it, and that we have a president who wants to terminate it. We have people who, some of his constituents, many of his constituents who voted for him, they, they want to stop that. They want to shut the, the whole thing down. They want to build, build a wall. Build they want to build a 2,000 mile wall. Yeah. At billions. Between right, and, you know, I don't even care how much it costs. I mean, that like that like that's that's another. But even even take the cost away from it, you know, a good part of the United States not that long ago was Mexico, right? I mean, I mean we're I, we're very far from that in in Hawaii. But if you spend time in Arizona, California, and Texas, um, you have um, you know, Native American tribes who have uh, who have land that crosses borders. You have um, families who have crossed borders um, seamlessly for many, many years. And now not only is there a very fortified border, but they want to put up a wall. And um, that's, and, and right, and, and, and a lot of the people who voted for Trump are absolutely in favor of that, which shows, um, I think, how far we've slid and how far we, uh, how much ground we need to try to reclaim to explain why that's a bad thing, why that, why that hurts all of us. Um, but I think, you know, as, as long as the economy's in the dumps, people are going to be looking for groups of people to blame. Yeah. 
and um, migrant workers, poor people, have always been are on the bottom. Here, that's the Micronesians. Uh, in in Arizona, in Hawaii, it's the uh, it's it's the Mexicans and the Central Americans. Yeah. Uh, the other thing that comes to mind, and I was reading about this recently, is that Pierre Trudeau, the the mm -hmm. Older Trudeau, I guess he was in the 60s, he was a very enlightened guy. And one of his big policies that he changed, it, it was disruptive in Canada at the time, mm. he opened the borders. Mm. He took in everybody. Now, Canada was taking a lot of people in after World War II and all that, um, but he opened it much wider than that. And he made a national policy and he made, he made incentives for them to come and disincentives for people to you know, not not treat them well. Right. And the result is Canada has a huge level of vitality, right. maybe even greater than ours, um, person for person, because they do that. And, and uh, it seems that we who were the beacon are no longer the beacon. You have asylum seekers in the United States who are afraid, who are dying, literally dying, trying to get into Canada. They're freezing to death on the Canadian-U.S. border, trying to cross into Canada because they feel like they'll be more They'll have a better shot in Canada than they will in the United States. Yeah, it does not. <laughs> Why did it remind me of the of the, the well. people who were trying to avoid the draft in the Vietnam War? Right. Right. They went to Canada. Canada accepted them with open arms, right. um, and you know, and that was really a, a sign of mm, a failure on the part of this country that we would have our own youth leaving town that way. I believe immigrants in, in Canada are called new Canadians. So there's this, I mean, it's, 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 it's you know, welcome. You're, we recognize that you're here, that you're here long term. You're going to be part of our extended, extended community and welcome. And there's a lot more done um, to work on integrating um, them into Canadian life. And, yes, um, that's true. And, and a much more beautiful, um, you know, welcoming attitude towards refugees and immigrants that, um, that I wish we had here. Yeah, so uh, after this break, Claire, that's Claire Hanus, immigration lawyer. Uh, I'm going to talk about how this changes the practice, if at all, in your immigration practice, and how it changes the views of immigrants, and whether, you know, it will ultimately damage us to have had this, and, and, and I'm, hope, I'm hoping we have to speculate on what's going to happen in the Supreme Court, but assuming that it's the same as the, these two uh, circuits, mm -hmm. uh, has this damaged us to the world? Has this damaged us to some of those really valuable immigrants who might come here and who we have thrived on in the past? We'll take a short break. We'll be right back with Claire Hanus. Okay, we're back. We're live. We're having a really interesting discussion with uh, Claire Hannes, an immigration lawyer. And um, I want to I want to take a, a little slightly different tack for a minute, um, and ask you know let's let's assume the Supreme Court does validate the Fourth Circuit and the Ninth Circuit on this, and it becomes the law of the land that he can't do this, and you know he can try all he wants. He's not going to be able to do it. Um, but even then, we've had a very unpleasant conversation. We've demonstrated we're, we're divided on the issue, at least divided. And we have a president who'd like to do, you know, go back to the 12th century. Uh, so, so the question really is, how does this affect your immigration practice? How does it affect the people who are in this country on papers that may not be so good? Mm -hmm. um, how, does this, how does this affect um, people who are outside this country who might have entertained the thought right. of coming here and making a life? Yeah, I think we have to remember that it's not just Trump, right? There's a whole team of people behind him that, yeah. you know, Trump didn't write his executive orders. He's, he's not that bright. Um, he had a lot of really bright ideologues who I 
are, are misguided, but they're not stupid. And um, and and lots of people in Congress who support, uh, you know, who, who wishes, who wish that they could get away with this. And so the message that it sends to the world is a real, I think, you know, um, uh, discriminatory intent towards uh, people from many, many different countries all over the world. And so one of the arguments that Hawaii made in this case was that it was damaging to the state's economy and to the University of Hawaii because we have graduate students at UH from these countries. We have faculty and undergraduate students um, and new from these countries. And new advertees who, 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 are, who are in limbo. And so even if the Supreme Court um, uh, you know, in, invalidates um, the travel ban, you're going to have people who have options about where they go, thinking about, do they really want to go to a place where it's so clear that among so many people they're not welcome, or do they want to, do they want to go someplace else? Yeah. Um, do they want to look at, at New Zealand or Canada or, or other countries? And uh, you know, a lot of those answers we won't, we won't know. It, it will take a long time before um, there are uh, statistics on, you know, declining enrollments from those countries. Um, but we're going to take not only a, a financial hit, but, uh, but a hit to these are people who could come, um, who do very well, who contribute greatly, um, who would like to stay in the United States and do great things, and who, who you know, who really um, enrich our communities. And they're not going to want to come here. So, it, I mean, that in some ways is it's a certain class of people, right? Because people who can come from, from foreign countries and study in the United States often are coming from more elite. So you have uh, you have that group of people who are impacted. But the other uh, executive orders that Trump has issued on immigration have had a, a real um, kind of similarly chilling effect in our community, but among different groups of people, um, people who are, are um, say, with final orders orders of deportation who had been in the past granted stays of deportation because they've been able to show that they have extraordinary equities and humanitarian concerns, usually involving having U.S. citizen children that they're primarily um, taking care of. And under President Obama, again, there were lots of really good people who were deported. It was not all roses uh, and unicorns under President Obama, but there were directives from the administration that prioritized uh, some groups of people um, above others. Um, Trump's executive orders, the other ones that were issued on immigration on January 25th, which are worth people going back and taking a look at. Um, basically get rid of those uh, those priorities. So everyone's a priority now. And, and we're, we're seeing that locally with more uh, more local clients getting these call-in letters to report for deportation. He's arrested 41,000 people, yeah. taking them off the streets yeah. and put them in detention. Yeah. One 41,000 people yeah. since the beginning of the year. Yeah. 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 Well, it's um, it's really too bad. I, I heard a piece on NPR. It was a, I think it was an Indian doctor and his mm -hmm. wife in Arkansas, the state of Arkansas. Mm -hmm. and he, uh, did I say doctor? Lawyer. He was a lawyer. Mm -hmm. He was a law professor teaching at the law school mm -hmm. there in Arkansas. And they had a life of, I don't know, 20 years or 30 years in this country. And there had been a racial murder nearby. And then with the ban and all this. But see, it's not just that we have a ban, but this this turns the rock over on people with hatred, right. and and then you have more hate crime, you have more racial and, crime, and that, which are very very well documented, right? It gives license for the haters uh, to come yeah. out, and yeah. um, and then they feel justified. Yeah. And so what so what happened with this with this lawyer? Oh, he he was talking on NPR, and he said, uh, you know, my wife and I, we've made our life here. We have kids, family, house. I'm a law professor. Right. In a, in a, I know American law, but we're going to leave. Yeah. We're taking off. Yeah. We, we don't like this country anymore. And I think, although not everybody's going to do that, it just takes a certain amount of courage to go to another place and start fresh. But uh, there are a lot of people who think about it now. Sure. Yeah. Sure. And that's, and that's, um, that's brain power that could be used to do other things. I mean, the fact that we in 2017 are talking in Hawaii about churches uh, offering themselves open as sanctuaries for people who are fleeing deportation. I lived and worked in Arizona in the early 90s. Uh, just a few years before that, there had been a very active sanctuary movement um, where churches and individuals were taking people 
who were um, in fear of being sent back to places that were dangerous for them. I never thought that here in 2017 we'd be having those same discussions again. I really thought that that was a closed chapter uh, of history and instead of um, instead of working on family reunification and um, you know kind of moving forward we're, we, we've taken a huge a huge leap back and I mean that's sad for me as an uh, you know as an individual but for the people who are directly affected it's it's really devastating and for the children who are really uh, affected it's it's devastating oh, yeah. tearing families apart tearing families apart people who have been law-abiding citizens uh, in the full sense of the word for a lifetime right. having their lives destroyed right right and um and how does that how does that benefit how does how does ripping these people the the, the local case of the kona coffee farmer that's gotten mm. actually national international attention because of the very powerfully written decision from uh, uh, another Ninth Circuit Unfortunately, judge. Unfortunately, he couldn't help. Unfortunately, he couldn't help, but I'm, I'm really glad that Jim Stanton pursued that case, and I'm really glad that that judge wrote that decision, because it's really powerful, and it kind of puts back in everyone's face, this is what happens, yeah. and how not only, you know, for, for this man, but how, how does taking him away benefit us? And, and ICE still has a lot of discretion um, to uh, whether to affect or, or to to not affect removal orders, um, I, I'm never sure on a local level how much pressure there is from above. But I'm sure there's quite a bit of pressure from above that even if people at the local level say, you know what, Mr. He did have a, a, a number of DUIs. You know, n none of us are flawless in our pasts. Okay, he has his he has his mistakes too. Um, but nothing that really justifies, in my mind, um, tearing him away from his family and, um, you know, and leaving his kids without a father mm. day to day. There's a morality here. There's a, there's a whole ethical world that opposes this sort of thing. Yes. And, and you, I mean, you're, you've been... So activists is maybe maybe it's the right word. You're kind I'm, of. A, I'm fine with that. Okay, I'm fine she's, with she's that good word. with activism. I like that. <laughs> Claire Hannes is a is a sort of an activist immigration lawyer. She yeah. takes these takes these issues very seriously. Yeah. She represents her clients with great zeal, and she sees the larger process and wants to protect people right. and do the right thing. It's it's an ethical, moral kind of thing. How does it affect you? You must be kind of <laughs> in a state over this. And how does it change your practice? Hmm. Yeah, it, it, it personally takes a toll on me. It takes a toll on my husband and my kids. Um, uh, again, not nearly the kind of toll that it takes on my clients. So I always have to. I always have to remember that um, I, I can try to walk in their shoes. I think I I try to do that, but I'll, I'm, you know, my shoes are not their shoes. I I was um, I was born with with a great deal more privilege and opportunity. Um, than than a lot of my clients, um, you know. On the it's really about um, kind of sustainability and not burning out and finding solidarity. I think with with people who also care about these people the way I do and who will come out and support them in different ways. I can support them by helping them with their legal issues as best I can. But other members in the community, maybe who don't have the legal background, have come out in support in, in so many other ways. And that um, feeling like I'm 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 not at all a lone voice. Um, and and when this it, you know it, it's a long it's a long struggle, um, and we have to sustain mm -hmm. each other. And looking back on on kind of the old fighters of past and how they were able to um, maintain themselves and sustain themselves are, are, are what I look at for my examples. I don't have really the luxury of um, of burning out. I have to keep going. And you know, we had an experience last week that was really powerful, where um, one of my clients had to report for deportation, and we applied for a stay of removal, and the, the um, we're waiting to to find out what's going to happen, but. Um, ICE decided, to, Immigration Customs Enforcement decided to, to set a bond on her, and it was $5,000, and that was far more than she's a single mom of, of two U.S. citizen children. That was far more than she could she could pay. And there were a group of 35 or 40 people who had come to support her. 
And these aren't people who knew her. These are just people who knew enough about her and thought that what was going on was wrong and they wanted to be there and, and not have her feel alone. And they very quickly raised that $5,000 for Bond. Good and good they, work. Were, they were so happy to do it. People were writing checks for $500, apologizing that it could not be for more. So we have, we really have a lot of uh, aloha, a lot of love in our community and support for these people. And, um, and if you're watching this and if you're interested in doing more, you know, contact me, contact Harris United Methodist Church has been a leader, Church of the Crossroads has been a leader in this issue. Um, we have a, a good, strong, growing network um, of immigrant rights activists yeah. in Hawaii, thankfully. But aside from paying for bonds, I mean, what, what can you do if the Immigration Service is down on these people as a matter of not only these executive orders, but the whole tone of this administration is to go after, go after anybody? Uh, 41,000 arrests, uh, and that was just somebody passed the word, we want you to right. arrest more people. Right. Uh, that was not these three orders. It was we want you to arrest more people. Yeah. So we have we have to we have to resist in many different ways. How um, do you do that? Well, yeah. There, I mean, How do you do as a lawyer? Ah. Uh, so so there are you know constitutional challenges that can be brought. Things like like the suit that Hawaii is bringing. We can support our attorney general and say you know thank you for this. Continue doing that. That that sends a message. That yeah. sends a message even to people who aren't affected by yeah. this ban. Um, that that we see immigration. We see diversity as a good thing. Um, it can be done individually in different cases. There are different class actions that are being brought. There are class actions being brought and and suits. Um, protecting sanctuary city status um, in other places. So, you know, we can we need to educate ourselves, learn about these things, and um, try to implement best practices here. So it's, it's both on a very individual level as far as um, individuals affected, and it's in a larger kind of global global picture. And we've had, you know, resolutions introduced um, and passed by the city council supporting um, uh, our, our diverse communities and what immigrant and re really re resisting um, Trump policies. And so there's lots of lots of different ways of, of pushing back. Yeah. And, and the good news is that the at least the, the federal and probably, well, I, I would say federal and state uh, judicial mm -hmm. systems mm -hmm. are fair minded about this. They're not accepting his policies when there are constitutional issues like this. That's so right. That's right. You can right. have new confidence that there's somebody who will listen to you right. when you take a position against this policy. Right. Sometimes. And that and that helps give us strength to go, you know, another yeah. day. Yeah. Right. So, but getting to the getting to the uh, where this is all going though, um, so we have now Supreme Court wants appeals from the administration on both the Ninth Circuit and the Fourth Circuit, and uh, presumably uh, the Attorney General. Whoever he may be at that time, <laughs> it's not clear to me. Right. Um, we'll then, you know, argue the case and uh, well, take the case up right. and uh, and uh, it'll right. it'll be resolved at, at the Supreme Court as to whether these um, what do you call it injunctions against the ban are valid, right. um, and that will come up probably in November, the next session because right. they. They're just about to go on their break, and they'll be back late October, early November. What do you think will happen? What will happen in the, in the interim first? Okay, presumably there are injunctions against the enforcement of at least the first and third, maybe all three of those banned executive orders. The status quo is he cannot enforce them, right? Right. Right. Um, so, and you know, as far as as far as the executive order, um, you know, the you know the, the Muslim ban. I mean, and the and the refugee ban. I mean, people. You know, people are still are still coming in. Although, you know, th there might be people who are choosing to go other places. Again, we don't we don't know. Um, so, I think it's really, you know, some of this is is just wait and see. I mean, there's not. Um, there's not much on, on, on these issues in the courts that we can do affirmatively, except again to um, to let our, our governor and attorney general know that the, that we support um, the actions that Hawaii has taken. You know, it's it's hard to see how how the Supreme Court could um, could. Um, rule against this, what the Ninth Circuit did. The, the, these aren't super complicated arguments, actually. Um, you know, that, that there are limits to the president's power, 
the president clearly exceeded them. Um, and you know, we have a, a, a new uh, uh, Supreme Court justice, and we'll just have to wait and see. Yeah. We'll know more. We'll know more about the yeah, new I, Supreme I, I, Court. I, yeah, I'm sorry. I wish I had the, the crystal ball, but it's very it's, it's, it's cloudy right now. I don't know. Yeah, but I think there'll be events. I don't think the Supreme Court is completely isolated from the events that take place in the country and the expressions right, of right, public opinion right. about this issue. Right. I, and I think they, they will be affected, and my, my guess would be is that uh, they will affirm both the Ninth Circuit and the Fourth right. Circuit. I'm knocking wood. And uh, hoping that they hear us. I would think so. This. And then, and then, in the you know, in the meantime, while we're kind of maybe in a wait and see um, mode on on the Supreme Court, we need to be very vigilant as to what's happening in our local communities as far as uh, deportations and um, law enforcement actions yeah. and um, possible collusion between local law enforcement and federal law enforcement. Yeah. And um, really, have uh, Hawaii is a, a kind of a, a tricky state because we have. The neighbor islands, and we really need to keep our um, ears to the ground on all the islands. And um, and we, but we form some pretty quick um, kind of you know rapid response networks, and those networks are growing because more and more people are just totally outraged, yeah. and to the point of saying, "What can I do?" And really ready to. Um, there, you know, some of the people who are, are are coming out in support are kind of you know the old timers, but there's a lot of new people. Um, who are, again, just, just outraged and, and want to open their hearts and open their pocketbooks to help people in our community. So, and those, again, those networks are growing, and mm -hmm. people are in it for the long haul. So we it's have to normal, pace ourselves. It's fine. It's, it's a, it's, it gives you a good feeling about the Hawaii diversity and about maybe um, the country at some level. Yeah, it really but, represents the best of, you know, some of this represents the worst of humanity, and then what we're seeing in Hawaii yeah. really counterbalances that to show the best. But it, it's, a, it's an issue we didn't have to have. It's a controversy we didn't have to have. No, and I mean, there's so many. It, it's so one, many other yeah, important things. It's one of so many controversies that yeah. we don't. I mean, we're, just, we're only talking about immigration. We're not talking about um, women's rights. We're not talking about environmental rights. Uh, you know, and all, and all of those, I think all of those movements that had made um, so many grounds, health care, are all in a um, really trying to hold on desperately to the gains that have been made, um, and but, but really hoped to be much further along in advancing the issues. Thank you, Claire. Thank you, Jay. Claire Hannes, immigration lawyer par excellence. Thank, Thank you, you so, so much. Kind. <laughs>